Americans in the 19th century, freedom meant owning land. If you owned your own farm, you weren't beholden to anyone. This land was made for you and me. The property in the East was largely spoken for, but the vast Western Plains were inviting. Back in 1862, while the Civil War still raged, Congress had passed a bill called the Homestead Act. It said for the sum of $10, any citizen could have 160 acres of public land. This land was made for you and me. As soon as the war was over, millions of people headed west to claim their own piece of the frontier. From the very beginning of our history, there has been this problem that owning land has been essential to white people's definition of freedom, and yet, from the colonial period on, there were large chunks of land owned already or occupied already by Native Americans, by Indians. So the freedom of many white Americans depended on dispossessing the freedom of this other people. At first, the new Americans and the Native Indians tried sharing the land, but it didn't work. The Plains Indians had long depended on hunting. They needed land free and uncultivated so the vast herds of buffalo and deer and antelope could roam. The new settlers were mostly farmers. They needed land cleared of wild animals so their crops wouldn't be trampled and eaten. Old Lady Horse was a Kiowa Indian. The white men hired hunters to do nothing but kill the buffalo. Up and down the plains those men ranged, shooting. Behind them came the Skinners. They piled the hides into the wagons until they were full. Sometimes there would be a pile of bones as high as a man stretching a mile along the railroad track. But it was not just the buffalo that were under attack. Over the years, in treaty after treaty, Native Americans had been promised that if they would move just once more, they would be left alone. First, they'd been asked to move across the Appalachians, then across the Mississippi River. Eventually, it was off any good land left in the West. Sitting Bull was a chief of the Sioux Indians. When I was a boy, the Sioux owned the world. The sun rose and set on our land. Where are the lands today? What treaty that the white men ever made with us have they kept? Not one. Viewed as savages who needed to be Christianized, many Indians were now forced onto state-sponsored reservations or put into missionary schools, as was Lone Wolf, a Blackfoot Indian. It was very cold that day when we were loaded into the wagons. None of us wanted to go, and our parents didn't want to let us go. Once at the school at Fort Shaw, our belongings were taken from us, placed in a heap, and set afire. Next to go was the long hair, the pride of all the Indians. The boys, one by one, would break down and cry when they saw their braids thrown on the floor. For many Indians, there seemed to be no choice now. It was move or fight. 
Native American men and women now faced machine guns, cannons, and army troops, as well as diseases that the newcomers brought with them. William Tecumseh Sherman was commanding general of the U.S. Army. The more Indians we can kill this year, the less will have to be killed the next war. For the more I see of these Indians, the more convinced I am that they all have to be killed or be maintained as a species of paupers. The Native Americans fought back with all the energy they had, and peaceful settlers often became victims of angry Indians. Wagon trains heading west were in constant danger of ambush. Sarah Raymond kept a diary during her crossing of the plains. Just after we crossed a bridge, a tire became loose on the last wagon of our freight train. The men stopped to fix it. An hour later, some of the others came back to see what kept them. There they were, dead and scalped, horses gone. The Indians had taken all the freight they could use, piled wood under the wagons, and set them on fire. In 1875, the U.S. government decided to confine all remaining Plains Indians onto reservations. Those who resisted were to be captured or shot. One of the Army men ordered to accomplish the new goal was Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. Custer was flashy. He had long blonde hair that hung in ringlets to his shoulders. And he was brave. During the Civil War, he had 11 horses shot out from under him. But he was also impulsive and vain. And in 1876, these faults finally caught up with him. On June 25th, after ignoring his scouts' reports, Custer led 266 soldiers against thousands of Cheyenne and Sioux Indians gathered at the Little Bighorn River in central Montana. It came to be known as Custer's Last Stand because Custer and all his men were killed. Chief Crazy Horse was the leader of the Sioux attack. They say we massacred Custer, the long hair, but he would have done the same thing to us had we not defended ourselves and fought to the last. The Nez Perce Indians live far to the west, in the land where Idaho, Washington, and Oregon today come together, a land of lush valleys, grassy prairies, steep mountains, and canyons. The Nez Perce were mighty hunters and known for their strong bows. And until gold was found on their land in 1860, they lived in peace with outsiders who passed through their territory. But then white miners couldn't be kept away. In 1876, the year of Custer's last stand, the U.S. government sent three commissioners to meet with the Nez Perce's Chief Joseph, whose real name was Henmatuya Locket, thunder rolling in the mountains. The Nez Perce must go, and quickly, they said. Fearing an attack by the U.S. Army, Chief Joseph rounded up his people and headed for a place where he thought they would be free, Canada. It turned out to be a 1,000-mile journey, twisting and turning throughout the American West. Chief Joseph led his small band for more than a year, again and again outwitting their pursuers. But just 30 miles from Canada, on October 5, 1877, the Nez Perce were surrounded. Charles Erskine Wood was among the Army forces. About an hour or so before sunset, there came up from the ravine below a picturesque and pathetic little group. Slowly, they mounted to where we stood at the top. Then Joseph threw himself off his horse, dropped his blanket about him, held himself very erect, and with quiet pride, held out his rifle in a token of submission. I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. The old men are dead. The little children are freezing to death. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. 
Promises were made to Chief Joseph, but they were never kept. The Nez Perce were sent to an empty plain where most grew sick and many died. We only ask an even chance to live as other men live. Let me be a free man, free to travel, free to stop, free to work, free to follow the religion of my fathers, free to think and talk and act for myself. And I will obey every law or submit to the penalty. Chief Joseph pleaded for justice, but he never got it. When he died many years later, the doctors listed the cause of death as a broken heart. In 1890, there was a final battle against Western Indians at a place called Wounded Knee. Thousands of troops were sent into South Dakota where a large group of Sioux Indian men, women, and children were gathered for worship. On December 29th, a confrontation turned violent. Well, the Battle of Wounded Knee was not really a battle in the sense of two armies confronting each other. It was really a massacre. It mostly involved the killing of women and children, but it symbolized the final end of centuries of battle between white society's desire to take over Indian land and the Indians' unsuccessful struggle to maintain as much of their traditional culture as they possibly could. This seems to be the last moment of that long history of dispossession of the Indians and depriving them of what they defined as their own freedom. By the 1890s, following the Battle of Wounded Knee, there were fewer than 2% of the original native population left in America. Many of the homesteaders who were pushing the Indians onto reservations were immigrants. In the half century after the Civil War, some 26 million immigrants arrived in the United States. Most sailed into New York City, where they were received at a center called Castle Garden. After 1892, they came through Ellis Island. This land is your land. In the 19th century, of course, immigrants came from many, many different parts, mostly of Europe, although some Chinese came in on the West Coast. Many of them were seeking freedom of one kind or another. Most were probably motivated by economic need, fleeing the Irish famine, fleeing poverty in Eastern Europe. But then there were those who came to worship freely, which they couldn't do in various parts of Europe, to avoid the oppressive tax systems and the army drafting you in to fight in the wars of Europe. And in all these ways, immigrants frequently wrote back to the old country about just enjoying freedom. This is a land of freedom in ways which really couldn't be duplicated in Europe in the 19th century. One immigrant who headed for the United States was Jacob Rees. As a boy in Denmark, he had read cowboy books about America. When he arrived in New York, he expected to be confronted by buffalo and cowboys. The first thing he did was take half his money and buy a gun. But he was surprised to find New York, he said, as civilized as Copenhagen. A friendly policeman saw his gun tucked in his belt and advised him to leave it at home. I took his advice and put the revolver away, secretly relieved to get rid of it. It was quite heavy to carry around. Like many immigrants, Jacob Reese was very poor. It took him seven years to get a good job. It was as a newspaper reporter and photographer. Jacob Rees showed the rest of the country how most immigrants were forced to live on overcrowded streets and in tenement buildings in conditions that would be illegal today. His pictures and words were published as a book which helped get laws passed to make things better. I have aimed to tell the truth as I saw it. If my book shall have borne ever so feeble a hand in garnering a harvest of justice, it has served its purpose. All around me a voice was sounding. This land was made for you and me.
There were some Americans in the 19th century who didn't want newcomers in the country. And even some of the newcomers, once they got settled, didn't want any other immigrants to come. Many of them feared competition for jobs. Usually, the newest immigrants were willing to work hard and for less money than those who had arrived earlier. They didn't stop to think that the newcomers were often doing jobs no one else wanted to do. Scrubbing floors, digging ditches, building railroads. Many new Americans faced discrimination just because they were Catholic or Jewish or Irish or Asian. A West Coast group called the Working Men's Party had as its slogan, the Chinese must go. The Chinese are just what they were in their native lands with all their idolatry, vice and heathen customs. Very few of them ever change in character to become Americanized. Between 1849, when gold was discovered in California, and 1882, when the Chinese Exclusion Act closed America's doors to them, about 300,000 Chinese emigrated to America. Once here, many of them were met with hatred by people who were fearful of them for their dark skins and different customs. Hoodlums in the West burned their homes and businesses. Mobs in California attacked and killed Chinese people. It was San Francisco that had the largest Chinese immigrant population in America. Two thirds of the laundries in this Western city were owned and run by subjects of China. And it was here that a momentous incident took place. In the summer of 1885, Sheriff Peter Hopkins entered the Yik Wo Laundry with a warrant for the arrest of the owner, Lee Yik. The Yik Wo Laundry was in a wooden building and a new city ordinance required all laundries to be operated in brick buildings. But while almost all the Chinese laundry owners were arrested, only one of the hundred or so white owners was, and that may have been because she was a woman. The Chinese launderers got together and sued the sheriff. The case was called Yik Wo v. Hopkins, and eventually it reached all the way to the Supreme Court. Well, the Yik Wo case is quite important because it exemplifies how the boundaries of freedom get expanded as excluded groups try to en enhance their own freedom. This case was based on the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which was passed after the Civil War, basically to guarantee the rights of the former slaves, to make sure they were treated equally now that they were free. And in going to court and getting that right of equal treatment before the law, the, this Chinese individual actually showed how the definition of freedom could be expanded even beyond where it was originally intended. In a landmark decision still important to this day, the Supreme Court decided in favor of Yik Wo. In doing so, the court ruled that the 14th Amendment, with its promise of equal protection under the law, applied not only to citizens, but to non-citizens as well. It was a victory for freedom that has not always been remembered. Mary Anton was born in Russia, the daughter of a Jewish storekeeper who yearned to immigrate to America. Later, when she grew up, she would tell her life story. I began life in the region of Russia, known as the Pale of Settlement. Within this area, the Tsar commanded me to stay with my father and mother and friends and all people like us. We must not be found outside the pair because we were Jews. In 1894, when Mary was just 13, she made the journey to America on an immigrant ship. When she and her mother and sister sailed into Boston, it was as if they had come from the Middle Ages into the modern world. So many lamps, and they burned until morning, my father said. And so people did not need to carry lanterns. In America, then, everything was free, as we had heard in Russia. 
light was free. The streets were as bright as a synagogue on a holy day. Education was free. That my father had written about repeatedly as comprising his chief hope for us children, the essence of American opportunity. It was the one thing he was able to promise us when he sent for us, surer, safer than bread or shelter. When public school opened that fall, Mary Anton was almost beside herself with excitement. She soon became the best student in her class. When she wrote a poem about George Washington and it was published in a newspaper, the whole school was proud of her. But proudest of all was her father, whom Mary revered for teaching her the meaning of American freedom. The boasted freedom of the new world meant to him far more than the right to reside, travel, and work wherever he pleased. It meant the freedom to speak his thoughts, to throw off the shackles of superstition, to test his own fate, unhindered by political or religious tyranny. Years later, when she wrote her autobiography, Mary called it The Promised Land. In it, she wrote of her adopted nation's priceless heritage. It was the freedom and opportunity that let the poorest immigrants become some of the most productive citizens any country has ever known. This land was made 